The concept of death in video games is not a new one. A great number of games rely on death as a mechanic often used to punish the players for their mistakes. Put simply, it is the element that raises the stakes in our experience with the games we play. Some other games, however, use death as a gameplay element, such as the Soul series and Hollow Knight, with the game currency being dropped upon death, having to backtrack to get it back. Sifu makes you character older upon death, increasing the damage you deal by reducing your health points, and many survival games implement mechanics where you may lose progress on items when you die, dropping them off in the world or even losing them permanently. In many cases, dying is just part of the many games we play. However, these games can also deal with death in another way, where the line between the game and our emotions may become blurred, where the focus of death and its emotional impact may start initially inside the game, but it becomes a real feeling for us on the other side of the screen. I'm talking about the emotional reaction that themes of death can cause in us as players, and throughout this video, I will attempt to not only prove how real some of these emotions are, despite being in a virtual world, I will also provide all the evidence that I have found in how these games can help us understand and sometimes even accept the feelings we can describe ourselves when death takes its soul in our reality, either affecting us or the people we care about the most. This concept was first brought to my attention when I started researching something known as the Chatrix effect. During my research of these emotional effects games can have on us, I found some testimonials on Reddit of all places of how playing Tetrix had helped people overcome traumatic effects. This piqued my curiosity and I found myself going down a rabbit hole of many accounts and research that had been done about this matter. In simple terms, the Tetrix effects occurs due to one of the many flaws our human brain has. It cannot multitask. It doesn't matter if you think you can, you're only distributing your attention into a group of stacks at a time, but are never really focusing on all of them at once. This flaw, however, in the case of Tetrix effects, proved beneficial as found in the study by Professor of Psychology at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, Emily Holmes. Can playing the computer video game Tetrix deduce the buildup of flashbacks for trauma, a proposal from cognitive science? PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder occurs when an intrusive memory from a traumatic event consolidates into long-term memory by playing in a visual loop on the affected person's mind. If we associate this video memory to something like, let's say, visualizing the bricks falling and the shapes we need to clear the stages in Tetris, then all of a sudden we run out of memory in our brain to consolidate the memory of the traumatic event, preventing PTSD from ever forming. Tetris also requires imagination and vision. Your brain can do two things at once, so this interrupts, explained Emily Holmes, whose team led the study that found this evidence. A second study presented in the Journal of Psychiatry and Neuroscience had two groups of 20 members each, both affected with PTSD, take part in the study. The control group would go through therapy to deal with PTSD while the experimental group would, in addition to the therapy sessions, play 60 minutes of Tetris per day. The study found larger hippocampal volumes in the Tetris group in both the whole brain and ROI analysis, and the playing Tetris was correlated with increasing hippocampal volume and hippocampal increases were correlated with continued reduction of PTSD, depression and anxiety symptoms between completion of therapy and 6 month follow up. Having clear evidence of games not only aiding but benefiting people after traumatic event, I asked the question, can games help us overcome one of the most traumatic experiences we can feel, that of death? Our journey first starts with an indie platformer game named Gris. In this game we take on the role of a girl that has recently experienced a traumatic event, leaving her world mentally and figuratively in shambles. Through the game we will explore the five stages of grief under the Cobbler Ross model, going through each stage acquiring new abilities that will help us progress in the game and through our healing journey. 
Grace's role or function rather is to abstract and exemplify each stage which the use of sensory aids. The environment and its colors are one of the most significant elements for this purpose. This allows the player to better understand the emotions they might be feeling, and associating each stage with the color they represent also aids in the recognition of each feeling someone may have. Denial, being bleak and empty, lacking color, having our player character move slowly and fall to the ground if they attempt to jump, and even lose our voice. At this time we have no other option than to walk forward, and as a clever hidden detail, if the player attempts to go back, they will get the denial achievement. Following denial, we arrive into anger. The first color to set in on this stage is red, showing the aggression we could be feeling, with gusts of wind that make us lose control of our character such as anger can do with us in real life. Only when we ground ourselves in game represented by acquiring an ability that makes us a heavy square, we can overcome the burst of anger that makes us lose control and continue moving forward. Continuing our adventure we land on green, representing bargaining. This level presents us with a little square companion that will help us progress through the level, such as the actual bargaining stage where we look to make deals with ourselves or the people around us to help us feel better about our situation. This companion can also signify how we're not alone during this process, and friends or family are always here for us, despite how lonely or reality might feel at the moment. Sinking in a deep blue water, we enter depression, that is literally making us fall deep into a darker abyss, one in which we could drown if we're not careful. The level also has many places where gravity is being altered, having lakes of water over our head, making us feel like we don't know which way is up. Continuing the themes of companionship, we find a big turtle to aid us in this darkest hour, guiding us out of the water and our depression. The turtle that could be representing the wisdom we achieved to get out of this stage, especially since the turtle illuminates our path, dissipating the deep darkness all around us. But what about the darkness inside of us? Gris also tackles and shows this danger, the darkness that won't let you move on. The darkness that makes you want to just give up after feeling such a traumatic experience. During the anger stage, our character releases a darkness into the world that I suspect comes from within you, since the initial form of this darkness was a reflection of you. This darkness in life as well as in game can take in many forms. It could be a crow representing death that keeps screaming at you, preventing you from moving forward, just like a voice in your head that might be working against your own interest, that doubt that so often makes us lose sight of our life. It can also take of the form of an eel that chases us down, trying to trap and consume us, such as the anxiety that if we let it, will eat us whole. So you might be asking yourself, what caused this whole journey to start? What made our character's world shatter into pieces? Death, the death of our mother. A pretty traumatic experience for anyone really, but Gris tells us that although painful, we can work on overcoming this trauma, and the game serves as a guide to the player for each stage, if not knowledge of how to go through each stage, at least a companion through them. It is from a player's love for her mother that we manage to move on. Throughout the game we're collecting little bulbs of light, or even maybe stars, it's not really clear what they are. What is clear is that they are integral for us to complete each stage, either making bridges for us to continue or unlocking new abilities to progress different sections. And if you get all secret collectibles, you can see the scene of how the mother teaches or shows Grace the stars. I believe the game here is making a metaphor, that those memories we treasure the most about the person that has passed are the stars that help us accept this person is now gone and acknowledge our happiness of having had the chance to have them in our lives. Moving forward with rich acceptance, get our voice back and see a beautiful castle in the sky that was invisible to us up to now. Just like our view of the world was clouded by our emotions, all that is remaining now is to reach the top of the sky with all of the stars, where we face up one last time with this darkness that takes the shape of our face. Grace finally overcomes it and kisses her mother's memories goodbye.
In a similar vein, Journey takes us to what the game title so cleverly describes as a journey. Another platformer, this time utilized in all three dimensions and a wide range of scenery through its levels, as well as a beautiful soundtrack. Journey serves as a metaphor of life and how it is just a journey. Its purpose is to make us aware of both the limited time we have in this world, but also to appreciate all of its beauty. The game starts off with a cloth creature in a desolate land, with the only purpose of reaching the top of the mountain that we can see in the distance from the start of the game. Throughout many levels, we help free these little cloth creatures and they repay this by helping us in our journey, becoming a part of us, letting us fly and reach places we otherwise couldn't. As we continue to explore, we find some tablets that give us some context to where we are and why everything seems so desolated and abandoned. Nonetheless, a hidden story is buried in the past, and at this point it's irrelevant, as the main focus is our journey, and just like in real life, we can find people to keep us company to support each other, and in the end, reach the end of our life. This is clearly done with a mechanic in game where another person playing the game may join your journey, but you, as well as the other player, are only able to communicate in chimes. There are other people going through their own adventures, but you can help each other out. I believe this mechanic, despite being really creative, also provides an example of our relationships in real life, how people come and go, as well as how we can influence and help those around us, even when we're on different journeys. Once we reach the top of the summit, we're presented with a beautiful area, feeling almost like we've reached the afterlife. And after a section where we're free to fly and jump as we get to the sky, our spirit is sent back to the start of the game, symbolizing a rebirth of sword, a new journey that is just beginning. While Greece and Journey provide an abstraction of emotions and realities such as life and death for the player to interpret on their own, the following games take a more narrative approach in order to dig into our empathy, making us feel connected to the situation and characters we're presented with. The game, before your eyes, delves with its gameplay and narrative in an interesting way. The title hints to this mechanic as life is passing by, well, before your eyes. This game uses a camera to track your eye movement and every time you blink, as blinking is the action in game that lets you progress making a metaphor of how life keeps going and can sometimes feel like it's going by in the blink of an eye. Before your eyes will skip time every time you blink, could be minutes, could be years. The game uses this mechanic to tell the story of a soul in the afterlife, one that is reliving their life to impress the gatekeeper that will let them onto the next stage. We follow the steps of Benny, a kid as he grows older, choosing different elements in his life that will end up making him a famous artist, or so he wishes. You see, in Before Your Eyes, death is present not around you, but you are the one being affected by it. Ben is diagnosed with a terminal illness, one that takes him at the age of 11, and the story we first ascribed to our spirit fair was the life we wish we could have had if it had not been cut short. After we get some context that we skip the first time around, we uncover the tragedy of our death, but not before we get a last look at our life and in a tear-jerking moment see how our life, for as short as it might have been, was a wonderful one, accompanied by a loving family, a great friend, and a cuddly one-eyed cat. Before Your Eyes not only obviously exemplifies how life is short and it can go in a blink, it also deals with themes of regret and appreciation for our life, regret that may come from the things we realize we couldn't accomplish in our dying hour, but appreciation we can get for the life that we did have and everyone that we were blessed to have in it. This game also shifts the perspective of many of the group stories I've experienced so far, as in this game we get the perspective of the person that passed, or at least the remaining seconds as they die from their terminal disease causing you to question many themes of mortality and putting your life until now into context. Would you be ready to live now? Would you have any regrets? Or would you say you lived a happy life? A major theme of this game also deals with our relationships, how we see them, if we decide to hold to grudges, or if we decide to understand and accept the people around us. 
such as a strict mother that, despite looking like she's fulfilling her own self-interest, is just protecting us from the regret she lives with. Everyone shows their love in different ways. We just have to learn how to identify it and understand it. The following game tackles a lot more about how families may see these events. What remain of Edith Finch. This entry takes us on a tour to the Finch family house. The Finch family is known for the history of misfortune, with all of their members dead by the time we start the game, except for one or two. The family's explanation of these events is that of a curse that was cast on the family. However, while exploring the house and all of its room, we deduct otherwise. Eddie, the grandma, made it her mission to remember everyone that lived in the house, so when someone passed, their room would become an altar to the deceased. One that will serve to remember not only how they pass, but what defined them in life. We see someone like Molly, a little girl that passed after eating a combination of toxic items, remembered with her creativity. The narration of the night she passed had us exploring the world as a cat, an owl, a shark, and a tentacular monster that in her story was the reason she passed after being eaten. Colvin, obsessed with space, passed after falling off a cliff trying to reach the sky on a swing, but he is remembered as finally managing to fly. Barbara, a child star that at 16 had lost most of her fame, is cemented in history via a horrific comic that explained her death as a paranormal event instead of a possible accident, falling off the staircase, or a murder committed by a crazy fan from her earlier standum. Walter, fearing the alleged curse, spent his whole life trapped in a bunker, only leaving to be hit by a train or falling off the cliff where the tracks used to be. We go through each room and discover the story that has been immortalized by Grandma Eddie. Fearing that the curse was only a self-fulfilling prophecy, our mom decided to lock every door in the house after our brother passed and our little brother disappeared in an attempt to protect us. Prompting us to leave the house, causing Eddie to mix alcohol and pills that proved to be fatal. And after our mother passed from an illness, we got the key to uncover all of these stories for ourselves. The story we're experiencing is what remained of Edith Finch. As we were reading her journal with all the stories from the time she explored the house, us now being Edith's son, who she was pregnant with while visiting the house. This game discusses many themes. The whole curse or no curse could be examined as how some people may or may not take responsibility for the circumstances, seeing as how many of the deaths were due to parental negligence or excusing their actions by using the supernatural or destiny as an argument for their death. This, in and it of itself, may not be a bad thing as these arguments could be a coping mechanism for some. The dangerous aspects come from when we start rationalizing or attributing everything to something outside of our control, making us effectively empty husks for whatever the world around us decides or to the other extreme, having such a negative response to these events we can control that we become trapped in our own imaginative reality, not letting us live our life to the fullest because of fear, just as Walter did after seeing her sister Barbara pass, blaming it on the curse. What remains of Edith Finch invites us to question herself and what it means to live instead of just surviving and warns us about the obsession that can grow after events such as death of those we care about. It might seem easy not to fear death when there is something like the afterlife waiting for you. Regardless if you're religious or not, it is common sense not to be afraid of the end of life if you're sure you're going somewhere after death, or if you believe you will be reborn. Death can also be brushed off with phrases like, they're in a better place now, or they're watching over you now. But what if religion is not a source of comfort for you? What if you don't believe in any of that? Are you just supposed to accept the excruciating reality of nothingness after death? 
In the last campfire, this theme is present throughout the game. We start as an ember, a little creature on a journey. Throughout our travels we discover others like us, and the forlorn, other embers that have given up on despair and decided to stop moving forward. When we reach out to them, we're able to help them ignite their hope one more time, effectively giving them courage to continue with the journey ahead. But what if this journey, it could be just a metaphor of life and death, or it could be a sort of limbo that souls come to before moving on to their final rest. During our travels, we're being stalked by the Wanderer. We can find many of his notes throughout the game, giving us more insight to their journey. The Wanderer being another ember that did not have a path as straight of ours. The Wanderer represents the fear of death and moving on. He knows that there is nothing else at the end of the journey, and believes that living comfortable stuck where you are is a better option to nothingness, so he refuses to move on. He decides that he will become the light for any other embers so that they are not faced with the excruciating realization he has come to, and even impersonates the king of the forest, who is a mechanical marionette of a bird to quite literally not let anyone fly off the nest, never to reach the last campfire. Ultimately, however, we unlock the door to the final destination and confront the Wanderer. Here the game discusses most of its own philosophy, that in fact you can input with your own choices. We're never ready for the end, although difficult, it will be something that we have to eventually be faced with. However, then it's not what matters, but the journey. It is our path and the people in them, the experiences, the knowledge we gather, the good, the bad, and the happy and not so happy moments in our life that give us meaning. Just like an old fisherman repairing a net, a cook making the best meal for the people he cared about, and a shy, lonely robot finally making a friend and a cool boat our journey was full of meaning, so in the end, it doesn't matter if there's nothing afterwards. In Spiritfarer, we take control of Stella, the new Spiritfarer after Charon retires for the time being. In the game, we will explore the Spirit Sea that acts almost like a limbo for different spirits you will encounter. Your job at this point is to complete the final request of each of your crew members so that they can be ready to move on on the Spirit Gate. As you keep on meeting new spirits, however, you start to realize that each spirit you take on your ship was someone you knew before you became the spirit fair. And ultimately, you will uncover what it is that ties them to this world, finally accepting their death and letting go to finally move on. As you delve deeper into each request, you start to see the personality of each spirit and their perspective of their current situation, enlightening us to how different it is for every person to go through grief. We have Gwen, for example, whose death is filled with regrets of her attempt on her own life that Stella actually saved her from. Stella's uncle, Atul, that one day after helping him with his request, he just disappeared, showing how death can be unexpected prompting us to care for those in our lives, as we may not know how long we have with them. The game has a hugging mechanic as a part of the gameplay loop, and when Atul disappeared, all that I thought about was that I wish I hugged him more times. But just as life, we can time death. Summer and Alice, both accepting of their own conditions and their death, wanted to cancer the spread and the other as old age took more of her energy each day. Stanley, the soul of a kid that left too soon, feeling guilt, not understanding his condition, believing he had disappointed his parents. These are just a handful of the spirits you can take on your ship, but as you can see, each one of them is completely different from each other. Death is an extremely personal thing. And this game does a wonderful job at making us realize that while pulling at our heartstrings. As you can see, death is different for everybody, not only in how it affects us, but in how we decide to deal with its effects. 
Some may go through the grieving process, bouncing from one stage to another, just like in Greece. Some will focus on the life they've had up to that point and appreciate their journey. For some, it might be a hard reality to accept, and it could end up in coping mechanisms such as avoidance as we see with Benny. Some may actually celebrate death and see it as a remembrance of the people they love either through memories like Edith Finch or through a spiritual or religious mean. Some may not consider any belief and just accept death as a part of life, one that has had meaning for them with the people they have known and the experiences they had like the embers. But ultimately, we must acknowledge that death is very personal, and it will never be the same experience for anyone just like all of our passengers we guided to the afterlife with Stella. With that being said, as I may not understand or know what some of you might be going through, I hope that through this video, I can help paint a picture of some of the emotions and feelings you might be going through, or might have to go through at some point in the future. And not as a guide, but at least as a companion, I hope that this video and all of the titles discussed in it can keep you company in these challenging times. Or at least you found this analysis interesting. Thank you for watching and have a great day. What is that? It's something new I'm working on. So you're writing again? Ah, it's just a melody that came to me. It feels good to play it. It's sad. Yeah, well, that would make sense. But do you like it? I mean, yeah. I love everything you do. What do you like about it? Ah, uh, not this old trap. Go on. I'm waiting. Well, it made me feel like... Like... Like if the unspeakable darkness I'm carrying can be so well expressed, maybe it's not so unspeakable. Nailed it, didn't I? Yeah. I mean, that was pretty good.